the new more modular Intel NUC. It's definitely not your grandfather's fig noggle. So this is the Intel 2286M, 2.4 gigahertz Intel, you know, Xeon processor. 2.4 gigahertz base clock, but up to five gigahertz boost clock. You know, memory's up to DDR4 2666, up to 64 gigabytes in this tiny, tiny little package. Okay, what we're looking at is the Intel NUC. This is the entire computer. It is a lunchbox size workstation. It's even got the power supply in the bottom. A Xeon, eight cores chucked right here in this thing. This is sort of nuts. Let's take a closer look at the connections on this thing. Externally at the front, we have a three and a half millimeter audio jack. That is a four conductor combo. So you can use a headphone and microphone like what you would use with a phone, three and a half millimeter jack. Headphones work fine. It's also dual USB three and an XDXC card slot. So memory, ingestion, media, things like that. There's also a large power button with a power LED behind it, but there's no hard drive activity LED, which I mean, I guess that's fine in an NVMe age, but I sure would like to have a hard drive activity LED. Also at the back, we've got an external regular power connector. It's a self-contained power supply. There's no external power brick, yay. We also got four full-size DisplayPort interfaces thanks to the Quadro P2200 GPU. That's from PNY. Thanks, PNY. I'll segue for a second and say the P2200 is a great workstation GPU that's qualified for applications like SolidWorks, Inventor, 3D Studio, and the Adobe Suite. These are put through a lot more software qualification than other GPUs. So it's nice to see a NUC that actually has PCIe slots that you can shove graphics cards into, at least up to eight inches long. And yes, we do actually have external PCIe power input, even though the 2200 doesn't require it. The way these new NUCs work is that everything is basically self-contained on one card. So the NUC is actually this here, but it provides an external PCIe interface. So that lets you have peripherals. So our expansion options are terrific. We can use that other X4 GPU. We can add in a PCIe Optane device or a PCIe video capture card and still have that one slot GPU or I can use a combination of the in inbuilt GPU plus an add-in GPU. If you are gonna add in a GPU, know that the limitation is 225 watts and eight inches. It has a six pin plus an eight pin PCIe power. So that can supply the power supply and this can supply up to 225 watts to that add-in GPU, which is really awesome. So while everything's on this one add-in looking card, this is actually the NUC. The CPU bracket is there, you can see. And the rear I.O. here is just like you would have on the standard motherboard. So it's just sort of everything soldered together. And then of course you get the CPU heat, heat sink here on the top, exhausting everything. But at the rear, we've got four USB 3. This is the five gigabit variety of USB. Uh, we've got two Intel, one gig NICs, HDMI, and then dual Thunderbolt, yes dual Thunderbolt. Oh, and that one lone three and a half millimeter jack? Yeah, that's got optical toss link built in. So if you've got an optical connection you wanna use, that's gonna work just fine. Now, a lot of people on the level one forum are chasing the ultimate, you know, sort of audio mastering workstation and they need the reliable Thunderbolt interface, but they want, you know, a relatively small machine. This seems like it's gonna be the perfect form factor. I mean, the physical size of this thing is 238 millimeters by 216 millimeters by 96 millimeters about the size of a lunchbox. It's literally a lunchbox computer. Internally, it has three M.2 slots, including two that are up to 110 millimeters and two M.2 go through the chipset and one is directly through the CPU. In terms of memory expansion capabilities, it has dual SODIMs. So it's a, it's a dual channel configuration that'll support up to 64 gigabytes of DDR4 memory. It's 2666. Uh, it will use LR, like the LR, LP, the new notebook standard, but that's limited to 2133 as opposed to 2666, but yeah, 64 gigabytes. And disassemble. This is the heart of our NUC. It looks like a PCIe expansion card, but it's not really. This is our Xeon CPU underneath the copper cold plate. We've got our two, you know, SODIMM slots. It's notebook style memory. We've got our connections for our Intel Wi-Fi 6 on top here. Now, the Intel Wi-Fi 6 module is soldered, seems to be, right onto the board. It doesn't seem to be like a M.2 upgradable module, which is unfortunate, but you do have M.2 modules here. Both of the M.2 connections here are through the South Bridge. They're through the chipset connection. They're not a direct CPU interface from what I can tell. However, this interface is a PCI Express by 16, and this breaks out to your NUC chassis. And here in the bottom, you can see we've got our other M.2 slot. So by default, with our Quadro P2200, or crap, with our Quadro 2200 from PNY, we've got a PCI Express by 16 connection. 
But if we add an M.2 or a PCI Express by four uh, physical PCIe card, then this interface will drop to by eight. But this is a nice layout because potentially here we can have PCI Express by eight plus by four for the NVMe to the CPU plus by four to a peripheral, which I think is a reasonable sacrifice given the platform limitations of using a mobile CPU. So even though this is a Xeon CPU, it doesn't you know confer any extra PCIe lanes overall. You've got the chipset lanes and the CPU has the dedicated DMI interface to the chipset, and then you've got 16 PCI Express lanes. It's just up to you how you wanna divvy up those PCI Express lanes in terms of peripherals. Now, because of the specific configuration of this and because we're using Optane, there was not really a performance penalty on this platform using Optane through the Southbridge chipset. If you had a really high speed Thunderbolt peripheral, like an external GPU dock, for example, then that might not be the case. I might be tempted to move this, this H10 uh, PCI Express NVMe card over to the NVMe in the bottom of the case. And for upgraders, like if you're gonna build a hundred of these and DIY your RAM installation or changing your M.2, it does take a little while to tear it out in the system. There's a bunch of connections over on the side. It's delicate. It's a little tedious. Oh, and yeah, eight core Xeon M CPU. It's a 45 watt CPU. But as you can see from our hardware monitor recordings, it does peak up to 115 watts, although 105 watts is a little more typical. Just two screws hold the top on, and that's where you'll find the, the dual exhaust fans in the top with a standard four pin connection. So if anything bad happens with the fans, this is a standard component with a standard four pin header. Get the little pogo pins to make maintenance easy, but this is really cool. Now one sort of odd thing out of the box when we got our unit from Intel, we, booted it up and I was like, that's kind of strange. Our unit was configured with the new H10 Intel SSD, that's QLC NAND plus 32 gigabytes of, of Optane, but the Optane was not configured at all. So uh, it's a little bit of a headache right now to set up Optane, so I had some trouble setting it up. But that's because things are changing. With Optane, you need a driver and control software. And the old way of doing it was you would go to Intel's website and download like Optane setup.exe or the Intel rapid storage technology stuff. But that's not really a thing anymore. Uh, the way that you're supposed to do it is Windows Update is supposed to get the driver for Optane, like the physical driver. And then you go to the Windows Store, the Microsoft Store, and download Intel's Optane control program. And then that sets it up. So I did the Windows Store step first, except it didn't detect the Optane. So then I downloaded the driver, which also installed an Optane utility. But when you run that Optane utility, it says, hey, this isn't supported anymore. Support is going away soon. You need the one from the Windows Store. But then the one from the Windows Store doesn't want to install if you have the other one. I mean, it will install, but then you run it and weird stuff happens. And so, got that straightened out. So the way that you want to do this is you want to go to Device Manager and have Windows Update find the driver. In my case, it didn't, but that's what you want to do. And then you want to go to the Microsoft Store. You don't even want to bother with Intel downloads. Uh, yeah, so, and then you can set up Optane as a cache. It's a 32 gigabyte cache on that one terabyte SSD on the QLC, and that improves performance quite a bit. So with that 32 gigabyte Optane set up as a cache for my one terabyte QLC uh, SSD, which by the way, all of that, the, the Optane and the QLC is on one NVMe. So my other NVMe slots are open. There's one in the bottom here on this PCIe card, and then the other two are, are sort of right here on the actual like NUC module itself. And that 32 gigs of Optane is really gonna help with responsiveness. I could score over 135 megabytes per second in Q-depth one, in Crystal Disk Mark, which is actually quite fast. I mean, the, the really high-end PCIe 4 SSDs, a lot of those can't clear 30, 35 megabytes per second. Uh, curiously though, in the Intel software, it showed as having 64 gigabytes of memory, and it, it took me a second, but it was combining 32 gigabytes of system memory plus 32 gigs of Optane. Uh, Intel, don't, don't refer to it. That's just gonna muddy the water even more. Like, I know the messaging is not consistent. Don't do it that way. I don't know what you call Optane because it is, it's halfway between NAND flash speed and storage speed, and it really does help with QDEPTH1 and machine responsiveness, but I don't think you should call it 64 gigs of memory and just sort of, I don't think you should, I don't think the software should do that. That just is gonna confuse people. Now with everything fully set up, what's the performance like? Well, it actually was very impressive for such a diminutive little machine. I mean, 
PC Mark 10 scores are very respectable. 97, 95, 82, 16 on productivity, 72, 92 on digital content creation. The Fire Strike scores were also not bad, although strictly speaking with this Quadro, this is not a gaming machine. CPU-Z, back of the envelope tests, 3.46 gigahertz was sustained even though we were hovering around 76 degrees C with a peak temperature and, you know, grueling, those grueling, you know, Prime 95 torture tests, 88 C peak maximum, but again, it seems to be targeting a thermal temperature of about 75 degrees C, which is great because those laptops that target like 92 degrees C, I worry about the longevity of those. In terms of like, okay, it's getting hot. How loud do the fans get? Small fans are loud. This thing was whisper quiet even when it was running full tilt, which was nice. You could definitely hear the fans ramping, but it still never got louder than a whisper, which is very welcome in a business environment, especially if you're in the cube farm and you're packed in like the like a veal fattening pen. You're you know there's going to be 50 high performance CAD workstations in there. It's going to get loud unless you got one of these. It wouldn't be engineering workstation benchmarks without SpecViewPerf benchmarks. So SpecViewPerf benchmarks were also right in line with what I would expect from an 8-core Xeon machine, you know, Cadia, Creo, Maya, 3D Studio Max. The performance was really, really impressive for this form factor. I mean, Intel first showed this off at CES. You know, here we are just a quarter later, and this is a fully realized product that you can pick up today. It's really impressive that they were able to cram that much package and also expandability in something this small. But overall, what's the value here? Well, this machine is for business users and it's from Intel. Can you build a faster machine cheaper? Absolutely. You can absolutely build a faster machine cheaper than this. But a DIY solution, do you really want to do that in a business scenario? Uh, this is a machine for business users. If you are a DIYer, you can build a faster machine. Yes, and the faster machine will actually be cheaper. You use a different CPU, probably different configs, probably gonna be a lot bigger. But if you're a business, you, you don't really DIY things. You don't even really overclock. You rely on a system builder or an OEM or system integrator to build a system for you, and they take responsibility. Hello, I would like to buy a bunch of machines. Will my AutoCAD work on that? Yes, okay, sounds good. It's somebody else's responsibility. That's what businesses want. I like that Intel is putting more work into this form factor to address, you know, what some users want because the NUC was a great home, uh, you know, machine initially. And there are versions of this with overclockable CPUs like the i7 CPU and you get some expansion and there are enthusiasts that want those features, but businesses want these features too. I mean, look at, look at the, the awesomeness of this I and mean, Apple take note, this could be the Mac mini pro because you get the expansion and you got Thunderbolt and you got a lot of stuff that people want. It's basically a Mac mini plus expansion slots. So with the right combination of features, this could be great. And Intel also seems to be paying attention to, you know, things like the PCIe layout, because one of the M.2s is wired directly to the CPU and the other ones go through the chipset. So you get a, the right mix of performance if you need it. You can have those PCIe lanes that go to the CPU for maximum performance, as well as the chipset lanes, so you can pack in a lot of peripherals. I mean, three M.2 slots and a chassis like this is great. Now we did all the benchmarking on Windows, but what about Linux? <laughs> we did all the benchmarking on Windows, intimated about hackintoshing, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> but what about Linux? Well, yes, Intel has also qualified this hardware for Linux. So if you want to run Red Hat or CentOS or Debian or anything with a relatively recent kernel, this is going to run fine on this machine. We've got the full suite of Pharonix benchmarks. The Pharonix benchmarks are right in line with what I would expect from this machine. I mean, even the Cinebench performance, I mean, Cinebench is Windows, but even the Cinebench performance is right in line with what I would expect of a, an eight core machine that's running in about the three, three and a half gigahertz range for Cinebench type workloads, maybe upwards of four gigahertz. So overall, this is basically exactly what Intel promises in a new form factor with some expandability. You know, theoretically, in the in the future, Intel could offer a new add-in card so you don't have to get the full NUC chassis. You could just swap out the motherboard CPU uh, and all that at the same time. If DDR4 is still the standard, you could bring in your same memory, your same M.2 peripherals, your same GPU that you've added into the device and not have to pay for the full NUC. The power supply is an FSP group, 80 plus. Uh, certified power supply. It is nice that it's built in and you don't have an external power brick like I mentioned before. There's a lot to like about machines in this form factor. And I like the fact that it's qualified as an actual workstation for engineering software. That's a big deal in business. 
I'm Wendell, this is level one. If you want to check out those Pharonix benchmarks, there's a link below. There's also a link to our other results on the level one forum and the level one website. You should check it out. I'm signing out and I'll see you in the level one forums. Oh, and big thanks to Intel for sending this over and PNY for the uh, Quadro P2200 graphics card. It made testing this a lot easier. And this is, uh, this is, this really is an interesting form factor, especially for the business use case. All right, I'm signing out. I'll see you later.